Hello everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith. We're gonna continue on for part number three of the Too Many Bones Undertow playthrough with Duster and Gasket. And first off, wanna jump straight to the encounter to talk about the voting that went on at the end of the last video and which encounter choice we're gonna be moving forward with based on your feedback. So first off, a huge thank you to everyone in the community that voted at the very end of the video, within the video, or left a comment, or commented through other means on social media. I tallied everything up, and overwhelmingly, the second option, Treasure Hold Your Breath, was the favorite of the two. And honestly, guys, I'm really not that surprised that the second option was chosen because when loot or treasure is involved, there's always an excitement that builds up as to what we could potentially gain. And of course, as we're traveling down the Sabran River, it's really cool thematically to think that we're essentially on the river trying to unlock loot as we're passing by it, grabbing it, trying to unlock it. And hopefully we end up getting something useful. But there is some stipulations here on how this is actually going to pan out. And it's not just going to be super easy but in the last video we did get something that's really going to help us out in this particular encounter so things really lined up nicely for us and I'm going to explain to you how that worked. So on the encounter card that you're seeing right here in the second choice, it says each gear lock is going to draw uh, one trove loot each. And when the gear locks want to make a lock picking attempt, which is going to happen right away, reduce HP equal to the number of attempts by that gear lock. And you may not lose the last HP. So really we have a number of uh, attempts to roll to unlock these trove loots, which I'll explain and you'll actually see how this works later on, but you will be spending our actual health. now. Why I want to talk about this really quickly is for those of you that might be confused between what we received at the end of the last video and now. We always have HP and that sits underneath the gear locks chip. So that's what's going to end up on us when we head into battle, that type of thing. And that's exactly the type of HP that we can only use to take a uh, lock picking attempt essentially. But we also gained what's called buff HP at the end of the last video and that sits separate on our prep area and basically allows us to soak up some damage. Now you might be thinking, hey, we've got buff HP, we can just let uh, the HP from the buff disappear, right? No, but what we can do is we can go ahead and lose a number of HP underneath our gear lock chip, which yes, will put us in kind of a, a less advantageous position potentially in the next encounter, but we can go ahead knowing that we have the buff HP to keep us from dying into the next encounter. Now, here's the thing. If you choose a passive encounter or an encounter essentially that's peaceful, like we do right here with the second option, the buff HP that we gained on Gasket as well as Duster, as you can see right here off screen, will not disappear between the different days. If we go into battle and we happen to come out of the battle, all the buff HP disappears. So we we literally could not have lined this up more perfect and honestly had no idea this was going to happen but it definitely worked in our favor that we have buff HP we get to keep while trying to do this treasure hold your breath option. So that's really, really cool. So we're going to jump, jump into this and spend the HP off of our gear lock. So first off, Duster has a total of four HP underneath her chip and Gasket only has three. So Duster's going to have a much better chance of actually getting through the locks in order to open up the trove loot, whereas Gasket may have to stop early because we, again, we cannot use the last HP under a chip. In other words, we can't fully exhaust ourselves trying to do this. So I'm only going to have two attempts attempts here with Gasket, and I'm going to end up having three attempts at the lock with Duster. And the last thing to mention at the very bottom of this particular uh, option number two is that it says successfully open trove loot are kept and remain unlocked, which is normal for trove loot, but unopened trove loot are immediately discarded. So in other words, we have this encounter to spend HP from underneath our gear lock chip, as long as it's not the last HP chip under a gear lock. And we can attempt to try to break into these trove loots, but if we do not, or we're unsuccessful in breaking all the locks open, we lose the trove loot. And this this is very different than normal. Normally when you gain tro trove loot, you actually get to keep it next to your character and continually try to unlock it over a number of days. But this is basically giving us a very small window to try to be successful this while also technically hurting us in the process. So thematically you could think of us trying to unlock these trove loots. Maybe we're grabbing them off the side of the raft and our head's half in the water and we're basically losing health, staying down there trying to pick locks when they're super heavy and we're dragging 
dragging them along the, the bottom of the shallow river, that type of thing. That's kind of what I've got in my head in terms of what's actually happening thematically. And at the very bottom of the card, it says both choices, encounter success is achieved no matter the outcome. So whether we get into the trove loot or not, we're still going to get that training point and the progress point at the bottom, which is also fantastic, along with holding on to our buff HP. So here we go, we're gonna start it off by drawing a Trove Loot for Duster as well as Gasket. Of course, whenever you draw a Trove Loot, you never, never, never flip it over because it's considered locked. It's not like loot, it's not just a chest you flip over right away. You've got these icons on the front of the Trove Loot card that will specify lever, trip, and force. We're gonna talk about how lock picking and the art of it works as we move into it. But first, we'll start off by drawing. So right off the top here, Duster will receive this Trove Loot, which will be the one that Duster is trying to break into. And for Gasket, we'll take the next trove loot in line. So now I'm gonna put these maybe on the battle mat and we'll get the dice tray all set up and we're gonna do some lock picking. So now we're gonna get into the exciting part, which is the art of lock picking. First off, I just wanna talk about what the setup is that you're seeing here in front of you. Now, because this is a different type of encounter, I've also got uh, Duster here because this is Duster's Trove Loot and Duster is just sitting right beside the Trove Loot because we're gonna be taking HP away from Duster. She's gonna be losing health as she tries to make multiple attempts to open this thing up. Now we can stop at any time if we decide we won't wanna push it the limit of this, but we can never spend our last HP on Duster. So the first thing you're going to notice off the top is the fact the Trove Loot sits to the right side of the Gearlock player mat, which may be not completely visible, but you'll see here at the very, very top of this screen, there's a loot section. And the loot section on the right-hand side of every Gearlock mat allows for two Trove Loot to sit there and be essentially tracked in terms of how many mechanisms you've cracked uh, as part of the lock you're trying to unlock. So essentially in this Trove Loot and in all Trove Loots, we have lever, tr Trip and force, and they're all represented right there. You can see that they're actually even denoted as lever, trip, and force along the bottom of the actual chest. And you'll also notice that the chest itself, the icon and the picture changes with each Trove Loot card. Now these locks are not always chests. Sometimes they can actually be bindings. The gear locks can find themselves in situations where they're actually chained up, locked up, and need to get out of something. So it's not always about getting something good. Sometimes it's actually about getting out of a bad situation that will cause you to have to use your lock picking skills. And that's when we start talking about the lock picking dice. So along the bottom of the screen here, you're gonna see the lock picking dice and there's three of them that are called action dice. They start on the far left hand side and move towards the right. So that's the brown, gold and silver die. They correspond to the different locks or mechanisms you're trying to actually break through on your attempts. One thing to remember is every attempt is essentially rolling all of these dice along the bottom, including the intuition die on the far right. We'll talk about more about what that does later, but really at the end of the day, it's a saving grace for you. It's gonna allow you chance is to potentially re-roll, convert dice, or save dice. It's huge and really does help you out so long as you're rolling what you need on the action dice. But basically, if I was to start an attempt on this Trove Loot, which you will be seeing in action very quickly, we're gonna go ahead and roll all these particular dice. Now, if this was my result right here, if this was my first roll, I would look at the very first lock. It says lever one. All I'm looking for is a die that either matches 1L or higher. And in this case, I landed it on the 2L. So what I would do in this particular case is I can go ahead and I can exhaust this particular die in order to go ahead and resolve this particular lock because it's above one. And it's even if it matched one, I'd be fine. And normally you exhaust it and that means you can't re-roll it when you go for the next lock. One thing to definitely make note of is no matter how fantastic you roll the first time, if you happen to get enough to unlock two in a single roll, you can't do that. You can only actually unlock one lock per roll. But what would happen essentially is in a, in a normal roll is if I landed this result, this die right here in the intuition is called a save plus one. And what that means is I can basically add one to the result of one of my dice. So I could bump two L up one. Now you might be wondering why I do that because I don't need it. But the other uh, wonderful thing about this particular side of the intuition die is it allows me to not have to exhaust that die. So I can literally roll again with a full hand of dice and I'm still in the same lock picking attempt. 
That is a very important term within the art of lockpicking is attempts. Your attempt doesn't end until you either exhaust all of your action dice. That's when you actually have lost all chances to continue forward. And that's when we'd have to start burning HP to get all of our dice back and try again and keep going. Now, whatever locks you unlock in a trove loot, you get to keep. So if I had landed this result and I was happy with it, I would unlock the first lock as a 2L would do that. And I could bump this down on the loot side of the player mat and I'd put this node right in between the two lines to denote I've successfully broken through the first lock. And then I would gather up these dice, thanks to the fact that the plus one added this, made it 3L, and also allows me to save it. I could roll all these dice again, trying to go after the three trip. And of course, there's one more really important thing to note about these dice. They're not all the same. So essentially what you're looking at here is three dice that correlate color coded to each of these three different locks or mechanisms on the trove loot. So a brown die is better or more efficient at landing numbers for lever. And a yellow die is gonna land trips and silver die is gonna land force. And you can see the color coding there on the card as well as on the dice, they actually matter. So three sides of each of these dies are gonna have a higher odds of hitting the type of lock you're trying to break into that becomes really important when choosing which dice to exhaust and which ones not to exhaust to try to break into a lock based on which other locks you still need to go through so hopefully that makes a lot of sense that's a really good generic overview of what we have to do but now we're going to go ahead and see it in action so just before we go to rolling our very first lock picking attempt, we do have to lose one health or HP off of Duster in order to do this in the first place. So one HP will be removed in order to make this first attempt. Cross your fingers and let's see how we do on the first attempt. So we're starting things off with Duster, the very first lock picking attempt here. These are the dice that we'll be rolling. The first thing I want to make mention of is the fact we need a one lever. That's the first lock we're looking to do. Now we can potentially get one lever on a number of these dice, but the one that has the best odds of landing it is the brown die. You'll see here that the brown die, as I mentioned in the last clip here, has three sides. So one lever on that side, two lever on this side, and three lever on that side. But other sides have totally different uh, ability to essentially help you on a different type of lock. So again, that's where the strategy comes in of what to use when, what to exhaust when, all that good stuff. Plus that intuition die is always there to help you out. So let's go ahead, without further ado, roll it up and I will talk you guys through how this works. So very first attempt here, we're gonna roll the dice, hoping to find a one lever. Shouldn't be too hard because one is a pretty one, easy one to land, but that's also my famous last words. So first off here, we've got ourselves one trip, one force, and a third three lever. Now we got the three lever on a die we didn't really want to land lever on because that's a die that's actually specific to trip. So if we exhaust that die to get past lever, we're gonna have less of a chance of landing the three trip that we actually need when we try to roll it. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but it takes our odds down a bit. This intuition die though got one of these particular dice, which does say re-roll one action die and also the intuition die. So right now I can choose to grab one die and I'm gonna gra grab the brown one because strategically it makes sense to grab the die that has more chance of landing the um, uh, lever side of things. And I roll the intuition die as well. So just to ensure these don't get knocked over, I'll take them out and put them aside for now. We're gonna re-roll these and hope that we land a lever here. Look at that, we got it. So not only did we get it guys, we got a perfect roll here because we got what I was hoping for, which is essentially a plus one on the lever. This is crazy lucky. Uh, and then on top of that, we get to, we don't have to exhaust this die. So we broke through the very first lock of the trove loot and exhausted no locks, or sorry, no action dice. And we were able to continue rolling all of our dice going into the three trip mechanism or lock we need to go for next. So first let's go down to the trove loot and unlock the first level. So we successfully broke through lever one with little effort. I mean, a one is pretty easy in the first place, but we just move it so that the two lines are basically on either side of the red node, denoting we've got through the first lock. We're still in our very first attempt, so we do not have to spend any more HP to continue rolling. We've successfully unlocked the lock, and when you successfully unlock a lock, you get to keep going within that particular lock picking attempt. If I hadn't have been successful in unlocking the first lock, that's when the attempt would have ended. So basically now I'm rolling a four dice again going into the three trip lock we need to break into. All right, wish me luck. Here we go. We're looking for a three trip. Hopefully we land this on the yellow die. That would be fantastic use. 
Oh, no, we didn't get it exactly. So what we have here is a two trip. We got it on the lever die, the one that's more efficient with lever, but that's okay because we've already got past lever. So I don't mind exhausting this one to try to get to the trip level we need. Here's a bad one. We got the other trip we needed, uh, but we got it on the force uh, die, which is not exactly the greatest, but it does actually equate to three trips. So we actually could exhaust these two to get through. But the one thing that I'm noting here, which is really cool, this 3L is not really worth it at the moment but it's going to be very good in a second you know why because we landed this particular symbol on the intuition die and that symbol is called a convert and it literally says change the lock type so that's either leader le lever trip or force of one action die and use it now we have to exhaust it but i can literally take this 3l and i can change it to be a three trip and that's a perfect die to use right now because that's the yellow one that's the one that has the odds of getting three yellow sides which is exactly the one we're trying to get so strategically perfect and we also fluked out and rolled to exactly what we needed anyway so i'm going to choose to use this i exhaust it in order to break through that next lock we are going to go into the last lock needing a total of five but now we only have two dice to get that on and i can tell you right now that is not going to be easy Okay, so now we're gonna signify that we've gone through the second lock of this trove loot. We're one away from cracking it open now. We just need to get five force, and we're still on our very first lock picking attempt, which is fantastic because if we happen to land this without losing any more than one HP, you could not ask for a better lock picking attempt. All right, guys, here we go. Wish me luck. We're looking for five force. I'm telling you, this is gonna be super hard. We need the dice to be in our favor here. So let's see what happens. Oh my gosh, did we actually do it? Oh no, we might not have. Let me see how this is gonna work out. So first off, we got two force three lever plus one and we're allowed to save so that's not going to work because the save one here is going to allow me to up one of them by one and the only one that would make sense would be to up this to three force but that's not enough to get me to five across any of the other dice so at this particular point there is no way that i can continue on because i can't actually apply anything that i rolled here to the lock to successfully continue onwards so this would signify the end of my lock picking attempt and we're going to have have to go ahead and try again by spending another HP from Duster. So Duster is going to lose another HP and doesn't have to. I'm choosing to do this because in my opinion, I think it's worth it. Plus I think the buff HP that I gained, which was two buff HP allows me the opportunity to continue to push the envelope here and try to see if I can be successful. So now Duster has down to two HP on uh, her character or her gear lock chip itself, but also has two buff HP for the next battle encounter. So that's not too bad. Plus we can always potentially heal before we go forward. I think it's still worth it. Let's roll some dice and lock pick again. All right, here we go. Hoping for good things. Now, this is the best opportunity I have to land five because I'm using so many dice from the very beginning. So here we go. Here's hoping. Oh my gosh, I got it. I got it. That's fantastic. What are the chances of that? I even get a reroll, but I absolutely don't need it. I got the five force I needed. This trove loot is broken open. Let's take a look at what we got here. I'm really excited about this because I have no clue what I got, but let's see. I got myself gadget armor. Let's take a closer look at what this one's all about. Now this is cool. I have never seen this card yet. I've never acquired this one yet in any of my off-camera plays. So this is exciting because I'm seeing all the options for this card and it looks crazy. So first off, it's called Gadget Armor. And the coolest thing about it is it says permanent. What that means is this will literally stay on Duster forever and can be used over and over and over again. Something that's really, really handy. Again, why Trove Loot is so awesome. So not only not a throwaway item, but something I get to continually use. And essentially what it does is it becomes a backup plan extension with one bone. So I can spend a single bone that I roll, which is super easy to get because you roll bones in this game based on the number of dice you're rolling and the odds are always about one in six you're gonna land them, some dice or more. Uh, but in this case, if I roll a bone, I can choose to use it normally for pack mentality, which is another ability that Duster has on the player mat for her but she now can use gadget armor and it says, choose one of the following, heal yourself for one HP, move one position, so it's basically like have a free dex basically, or deal one damage to any unit. 
Now, first off, it's not true damage, so it can't go straight past our armor, but it's still damage and it's still anybody. It can be any unit. That is so useful. It's going to come in huge when we start fighting bigger baddies and even getting into that final boss battle. This could be a difference maker. All right, so I'm really excited to jump into the next Trove Loot card. We're gonna start using Gaskin and have Gaskin try and unlock this one. You might have noticed that I put the Trove Loot up against Duster's uh, loot area. Normally, I would be putting this on Gaskin's right-hand side of the player mat, but uh, Duster's happens to be dead center, so for filming purposes, it just makes sense. Plus, if we don't break into it anyway, it's getting discarded, so I'm just gonna use it as a tracker. I'm gonna basically use Duster's side of the mat. Not a big deal. We need to get through two lever, three trip, and three four, so this is a dual one i actually thought the last one would be harder because of the five which is actually not that easy to land at all it's one of the higher numbers on trove loot uh we somehow landed on the first roll which was fantastic uh, and i'm super excited the fact that duster got that because it's such a handy one to have so i can't wait to see what this could potentially be if we're lucky enough to get it the downside is gasket is only three hp so i literally have two attempts that's it to get past all these and i might be in a little bit more trouble trying to do this successfully Successfully than I was with Duster. But I'm excited to try. So, first off, we're going to go ahead and knock one HP off to give this a shot. Let's head to the dice tray and roll away. All right, Gasket, you need a two lever. Let's go ahead and nail this right off the top so we can start off on the right foot. So we got ourselves, ooh, this is not good. We got ourselves a three trip. We got ourselves a three force and a one trip. Those are nothing of what we wanted, but we did get this icon on the intuition die, which is a reroll, thank goodness. So basically this is gonna allow me to go ahead and choose one action die and make a reroll. So it'd be silly of me not to go ahead and choose the brown die because of course I have a better chance of actually landing the lever results. So I'm gonna take these two and we're gonna roll them again. I'm gonna leave the other two in there because even if they move around it's not going to affect anything uh so let's go ahead and roll oh check it out guys a two lever and a reroll so even if we had failed that roll we could have rolled again but i landed exactly what i needed so i'm going to go ahead to the trove loot tick past the first lock the only thing with this is we do exhaust this die now so i'll be rolling to go for a three trip with only two dice now Okay, so the first lock has been successfully broken through. We're going to head to the three trip and continue our lock picking attempt that we're currently on the very first one. So no need to move any HP from Gasket because we're still in the same lock picking attempt. Here's hoping, cross your fingers, that we land the three trip we need. Come on, three trip. We need you. We need you. I want to keep on going through this. If we can do this all in one round, that would be our one lock picking attempt. That would be fantastic. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, that's a huge roll. Oh, that's perfect. So in a perfect world, now this is a great example, guys, of getting one of those rolls that's fantastic. That's literally the best I could have gotten from both dice. I got a three trip, which is the highest result on the trip die itself, plus a three force on the force die. Literally couldn't get on any better. It literally is the exact numbers I need to break the next two locks in a row, but this is a perfect example of what you cannot do. You're only allowed to break one lock, even though I rolled fantastic so that's too bad i really hope i can do that again because i'm going to need it but the cool thing is i can actually exhaust the die that is actually meant for trip leaving me with force so i do have a shot at potentially actually landing this and getting it all done in one attempt so we'll exhaust this die here the three trip this one by the way is the conversion one the one where you can convert uh, from different types we don't need it so i'm not using it and that's pretty much that we're going to head to the trove loot break past that second lock and cross our fingers that the final roll lands exactly what we need and gasket doesn't have to take any more hp and just like that another success we're down to two locks broken through looking for that three force let's get to the dice tray i've got a good feeling let's see if we can make it happen well, luck has been with me so far, and I actually cannot believe how well I'm rolling because the last time I played the game actually off camera, my lock picking skills were not so great. So this is a phenomenal turnaround from what I had earlier. So here's hoping I land the three force I need to crack this thing wide open. Oh my gosh, I got it. A two force plus one, and I can keep the die and not have to exhaust it. Guys, we broke through it. Like, I don't understand. I don't, maybe I should have tried this on like heroic difficulty or legendary, I should say. Cause like literally the dice rolls in this lock picking example are gonna make people think that I'm literally rigging the game. But for some crazy reason, I'm landing these rolls perfectly every time. 
I should probably keep playing all the way to the end of the game because uh, this is just my lucky night. But that was fantastic. Let's go ahead and find out what Gasket has gained. Now this looks super useful. This is called a water mask. And again, this is another trove loot that I have not run into in my off camera plays, but this looks awesome for a number of reasons. One of the biggest ones is again, it's another permanent ability I get to hold on to. It says moving on to wreckage, which we haven't seen yet, but essentially when we're using the raft or river side of the battle mat, we have a raft and at times wreckage can basically be uh, spots within the battle mat that are destroyed and cost an extra dex to move into them. So instead of one, it costs two. Well, now I basically don't have to worry about wreckage spots on RAS. So with that, guys, we can consider this encounter that you guys chose a massive success. Now that was a really, really cool and extremely successful encounter, guys. Probably the best one we've had so far and one of the most fun, to be honest, because I don't know how those dice rolls landed the way they did, but they were perfect. The one thing I want to make mention of, guys, you might be saying in the comments below, wait a minute, Gasket can't use items, loot, and, and things like that. And you're right, he can't. I just wanted to talk you through it because technically Gasket did actually obtain the loot and is allowed to carry them. But don't worry, I plan on moving that particular trove loot over to Duster as soon as I possibly can. And the good news is we're moving into the dividing of loot, logging progress, doing our training points, and after that we go to the recovery phase where I can start trading that loot over from uh, Gasket to Duster. So Duster's going to have not only the gadget armor that she picked up there for her backup plan extension, which is going to give her a whole bunch of options, but now she's going to have a water mass allowing her to go into wreckage areas for the normal amount of movement cost for only one dex plus not be poisoned or be immune to poison during water battles she is going to become a very very useful gear lock Right now though, we're gonna talk about the success at the very bottom of this card. It says both choices, encounter success is achieved no matter the outcome. Well, our outcome was phenomenally uh, successful. So we're regardless going to be gaining these points either way, even if we weren't. And we're gaining one progress point, which is fantastic, bringing us to a total of four. And we'll be moving ourselves along the adventure map very soon. And we also now have a training point to spend. So first off, let's go ahead and get that that training point locked in. So time to spend our training point on Duster. There's a number of things I could do. I'll talk you through my thoughts on each of them. First off, I really kind of wanted an extra dex because dex allows for extra movement and all that good stuff. But then I remember the fact that this gadget armor allows me the ability of using bones to basically go crazy. I can heal myself. I can move one position. I can deal damage. So gaining a dex is kind of counterintuitive to how Duster's build is basically panning out based on grabbing gadget armor, which of course we had no idea we were getting, but it already solves the problem of not having uh, or, or needing more decks to move more as well as roll dice. I might hold off on that and focus more on the skill tree. And I have two options here that I'm really kind of debating against, but I think I have a decision. The first one was Feign Death. Now this is something I still kind of want later on, but Feign Death has six sides as all these dies do, uh, but two of them are for healing of two, just a generic heal two, which is not bad. The other four sides of that die have what is called uh, basically Feign Death, which is the next time you would lose your last HP, instead of losing that HP, you set your HP to two and place an untargetable effect die on yourself, meaning you can't be targeted for that next coming round, which is fantastic. So that's really useful to keep me alive. But again, I kind of looked back and said, you know what, I've got this gadget armor on me. It's going to allow me to heal myself whenever I use a bone. What I really need to do is gain not only a die that's useful for the matrix in terms of bringing one of these skill uh, skills up to the next level, but also find one that potentially rolls bones. Because if it rolls bones and it can roll a lot of bones, it can really give me a lot of opportunity to use my gadget armor. So then I started looking around and I found this die right here, die number 15. This die is one I can unlock now because I got Promise of Prey last time. So this particular die here has four sides that are double bones. That's huge because when you get a double bone, you basically skip past the first one and place it in the second one and literally would allow me to use my new gadget armor twice over if I roll happen to roll those two bones. So in other words, if I don't get the most powerful effect from the die, which is on two sides, 
sides of the six, uh, I still can use it for something that is literally immediate and helpful, whether it's HP, whether it's moving, whether it's damage, all of which are very useful. So I really like that particular die. Plus I'm flushing out Nightshade's skill tree. And the coolest part of that particular die is if I land on the ferocity side of things, it says use only while Nightshade is on the battle mat. Uh, it can be used on either Duster's or Nightshade's turn. Nightshade gains one training point to be used immediately. So two sides of this die basically allow you to upgrade uh, to upgrade Nightshade to push to Killer Instinct or Alpha Wolf. So really we're pushing Nightshade to a really good advantageous position for us, especially later on when we start fighting the Tyrants and bigger and badder enemies to have an ally that's much, much stronger. So I'm gonna go ahead and take die number 15. And just like that, we've got the die in place. You can see there's four sides that have the double bones on it. The other side, which you can potentially roll here, is the ferocity side. And this particular side is gonna be uh, the one that can give you that extra training point to be used on Nightshade, which is really cool. Now, the other stipulation with all this is we gotta get Nightshade more involved in battles. And you'll see how I can do that when we move into uh, the next battle that we happen to face. Again, I have to be under full health with Duster to have Nightshade come out, but now Nightshade is extremely useful having two dice that can be used with that particular ally. So coming over here to our friend Gasket, we need to spend a training point here. We absolutely want to, of course. And in the skills matrix here, we've got options. We've got quite a few options, actually, and a lot of them are really cool. We have things like gut, for instance, which basically when somebody is bleeding, which we can do based on using cut, we can have someone on the mat that's bleeding based on that cut. And then you can use gut to basically hit them again and have them basically be bleeding out over time, which can really take them down quickly. So that's a cool one. Grab's a nice one. You can grab somebody from far away which eventually uses get which means you can pull them towards you these over here for ram and blitz blitz allows you to basically hit them with like kind of reverberating energy that kind of hits them or potentially goes through multiple units ram is kind of smash them out of the way take some damage on them and then push into their position uh, and you actually move them back one and basically take their spot there's a lot of really cool things with gasket plus all the directives which allow you to basically turn him into an automated machine that you have have no idea what's going to actually happen. Now you know the odds of what is going to happen on the dice, but when you roll it, you have to, in most cases, actually do that action and you don't have a choice as to whether you want to. In most cases, when you're rolling skill dice, you have a choice whether you want to actually use it for its effect or not. Uh, but in this case, with some of these directives, it actually states on Gasket's reference card that they have to be done. And that's what's kind of wild about Gasket. If you start getting some of these directives, it's cool. They have some good effects, but sometimes they can kind of position him elsewhere where you don't want him, or maybe he hits somebody that you wanted to hit somebody else or things like that. He starts kind of acting like a robot would, which is not exactly how you'd expect, which can be really good at times and maybe other times not so good. So I decided in this case to make it more functional. I want to bump up my attack. Now we want to bump this up to two. So I have to roll two attack dice because that's my total between my starting stat and plus one. The reason I'm doing this is I want Gasket to be able to hit hard and have the availability to keep on rolling those dice. And the only cost there is to roll that hydro valve at the same time. So I'll have lots of hydro and I'll be able to continue to just kind of put decent attacks up plus get my defense up. This is what I'm going to do is probably one more stat increase to attack and then we're going to go right back down in future training points and start flushing out his skills matrix. So let's grab two attack dice, head over and see if we can train successfully. All right, here we go. Wish me luck. Hopefully we see no bones here so I can continue on. Nice, it's a success. And of course I need to see no bones. I had no extra rerolls on that. Only on defense do you get one more attempt. I succeeded, so I'm gonna be able to bump up his stat here for attack to a two. So now he's got three dice available when attacking. So that is another successful encounter in the books. We're gonna log our progress by moving the bead down to the next node. We're right at one of the crucial forks in the road as we head towards the break. And now we move into the recovery phase. And one of the things I want to clearly state here, guys, is that when you acquire loot, even through an encounter, timing does matter. And in this particular case, Duster was able to obtain a trove loot. And if we take a look at how much loot Duster actually has in total, Duster still has four loot from prior. So at this point in time, Duster, she is over the limit of four. And your limit is based on how many trove loot and regular loot you're 
Terran, you can only ever have four. And this is really important timing wise because you would think that right now I could just discard one and say, yeah, I've got four, but actually the second that you acquire a loot, whenever that is, and in my case it happened during the encounter phase, you must then choose the one you want to keep and discard the other essentially. So I, at that moment, had to make a decision on which one of these four I wanted to get rid of. And there's no way I'm letting the gadget armor go, of course. So I got to decide one of these other ones to let low, to let loose. Uh, I really want to keep Fortunate Discovery because I think that's a useful one. This plated skull here says, at start of round, you may place a defensive die in an active slot. That can be really helpful in keeping uh, Duster alive. Malfunctioning mech is really good in terms of increasing dex and potentially keeping it if I use it against um, other mechs later on. I don't have to discard it. Loose wires, on the other hand, is once, and it just lets you increase your dex by one. That's it. This is the one I want to get rid of. I think it's the weakest of the four, so this is the one I will be discarding. So now going into the recovery phase and the beginning of allowed loot trading I have four loot here on Duster and I have four or two loot sorry on Gasket. Now Gasket currently has the water mask that we saw when I unlocked that and we know we want to trade that over to Duster. So again we run into the problem of a number of potential loot being over the limit and we also have the sabron kelp which is another healing card so what do we do in this case when we have four loot on duster and two on gasket can we swap things around between the two without having to discard any loot so in this case where Duster has four loot and wants to trade with Gasket who only has two, you would think if I was doing any trading that I would then go over the limit of Duster automatically or something, but you don't think about it like that because all the trading's happening simultaneously. So essentially, unless of course I push too many cards in Duster's direction during the trading phase here, more so than four, then I'm in trouble. But in this particular case, I can go ahead and give one of these cards over to Gasket at this point in order to safe keep that particular card. So again, I have my four cards on uh, Duster, so I'm still fine here. I wanna take the water mask for sure, because I don't know when it's gonna become useful, but it's absolutely no use for Gasket to hold on to it. And now I have to come back over here and determine which of these particular cards on this side I'm going to toss. Now in my case, I wanna keep the plated skull because I think that can come in handy anytime. The malfunctioning mech might come in handy if I happen to see mechs, but we don't know if that's going to happen yet. So I think this is the one I want to give to Gasket and I'll keep fortunate discovery for myself on Duster side because then that way I can actually try to gain a consumable die, which will be really useful during battle. So there we go. We've got our four over here on Duster. We got two on Gasket and again, Gasket's just keeping those cards for safekeeping and for the ability to discard them to up the power converter die on his mat in order to heal himself, which can be huge. So we have options either way there. So now we're done with trading. We can do lock picking attempts and we have no locks to unlock because we have no trove loot that's waiting to be unlocked. So we skip right past that. Individual options. Do we want to rest and recover? Do we want to search for better loot or do we want to scout the area? Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to use Flint and Tinder from Duster first to determine whether or not I even need to rest and recover with Duster. Flint and Tinder is a really cool die that only resolves itself within the recovery phase. So Flint and Tinder is rolled during the recovery phase only and I can heal any gear lock. So gear locks would be gasket or duster. That's not nightshade or it says slash right afterwards nightshade. So I actually can go ahead and heal nightshade. So I can do anybody that I currently have with me right now, which is awesome. But the only people that need health are gasket and duster. And I'd probably rather put the health on duster so that I can do something else with my individual option with duster during the recovery phase. So let's go ahead and roll this die. Hope for the best. I currently have two HP on duster right now underneath her gear lock chip. So she's got two and I can have a total of uh, four max health. So I'm really hoping to land a two here or higher. We got a three. So we got way more than we needed. And actually that was the best side of the die you can get. Two of the sides are threes, two of them are twos, and two of them are one. So we landed it pretty well there. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take two more HP and add it to the bottom of Duster's gear lock chip. 
So that worked out phenomenal. So two chips plus the two that was already on Duster. She's all the way back up to full health. I'll put her gear lock chip back in the prep area. She also still has two buff HP on top of that and nightshades full were great. Now the next thing we need to decide is our individual options now that we know how Flint and Tinder panned out. So now we're gonna go ahead and decide what we wanna do. We don't need to heal, so that's great. We could potentially search for better loot. So I could actually try to gamble here and discard one of my loot cards with Duster in order to try to get better loot kind of it might be fun to try it or we could scout the area now currently we've already scouted a number of different creatures we have a number of them revealed already from prior scouting so it might be worth it to try this gamble with the loot and see what happens so we're going to go ahead with Duster. She's going to do what's called search for better loot. Discard one loot card and roll six attack dice for each bone you roll. Reveal a loot card and you may keep one. So if we get lots of bones, we got lots of options to choose between. I'm going to choose to get rid of the plated skull. Yes, it is good. Yes, I could end up using it. But you know what? I want to show you guys another option as part of the playthrough. So let's just see if we get lucky. If we don't, we lose the card and we don't get any loot. So let's hope for at least a bone. So let's go ahead here, toss this one. It's gone regardless. And we're going to go ahead and roll six of these attack dice. So really hoping for bones here. Oh my gosh. Okay, so that is an example of what you don't want to see. So my rolls aren't always flawless, but we went ahead and risked it. And you can see here, risking it's not always the best. There is a one in six chance on every side of these dies to get a bone. Did not pan out for us. We lost the plated skull. It was definitely probably not the smartest decision, but I still wanted to give it a go so you guys get an idea as to how that particular option works. So now we move over to Gaskin. And of course I could go ahead and try to discard one of these loot cards that he has, but I'm holding them on purpose for Duster. So I don't necessarily want to let them go. And I want to also, if I need to discard them, use them to up the power converter in order to heal him. So you know what? I think with him, we're not going to scout. We're not going to discard cards to find better loot. We're just going to simply heal, which is not going to be a massive increase for him. He's basically just going to jump from two HP to three HP. So he's going to be full health. And that's good because you never know if any true damage happens to go through or anything really nasty. I'd rather him be safe for the upcoming adventure versus uh, being one shy or that last life not underneath the gearlock chip having to cause us some grief. So now he's at full health, ready to go, and we're going to go ahead now and move past the recovery phase and move into a brand new day. All right, we're heading on to day number five, which means our batty totals are gonna start going way up. Our batty point total now will be two gear locks times five. So we'll be going into a 10 point batty battle if we happen to run into an encounter like that, which means we'll be pulling two fives. So the baddies are now moving into a level of which is a little bit more stronger than we've seen before. So things should get quite interesting really quick. Here we go. We got ourselves encounter hitching a ride for day number five. It says, ah, peace and quiet fishing while we float down the Sabron. It doesn't get any better. Well, catching something on the end of this lousy makeshift fishing pole would be better. Whoa, I've got something. Wake up. Lunch is on the line. The raft violently gains speed while the channel narrows dangerously. It appears we've hooked a krellin in it leading us right to shore. Enemies on land have taken notice and appear ready to board as we go by. I can't hold it. Spear this thing before I'm pulled in. Nah, give it some slack. Let's let it take us for a ride. Well, we knew we were bound to hit a river encounter or battle at some point, and we have landed it. And you can see both of these choices result in a battle, so we will be on the raft for this one. So obviously, based on what we read, this is going to be a very exciting one. So the very first choice at the very top, I want to talk about the top left-hand icons. I've never mentioned this before, but just in case you ever wanted to mix your encounter cards that are undertow with your base cards, that's what that skull icon is for up in the top left-hand corner. It just denotes that this this is an undertow encounter. There's a lot of people I think I've seen on forums and stuff like that looking for that uh, particular icon, wondering where and what it represents. You're not gonna find it anywhere. It literally is just for uh, being able to separate out encounters that come from undertow if you mix them in with other cards. The one beside it though, 
represents the water or raft side of the battle mat. So each of these choices will result, based on that purple kind of wave icon, uh, in a raft encounter, which is awesome. And both of them are battles, as we can see from this particular icon on the far right. One of the choices has no optional, or, or not optional, but extra benefit. And the second choice does have an extra benefit of an extra progress point, because thematically, if we let this Krellin take us for a ride, we are double timing it. We're gonna get two progress points in this if we go that route. Now the first one says Spear of the Krellin. So basically create the baddie queue by the baddie points, then include a number of Krellin equal to the party size. So we have two gear locks, so two Krellin would get added in. All the Krellin must be eliminated by the end of round number two, otherwise there's a bad thing here. It says otherwise gear locks with the highest, or gear lock with the highest spot on the initiative meter is moved to the closest Krellin starting position at the start of round three. So that's kind of the other side of it. Now if we choose the second option, which is the one I'm slightly leaning towards because it just sounds a lot more fun, is go for a ride. Plus this will actually give us two progress points. We currently have four, this would give us six, and we'd be one away from having enough to go up against Nobulus early. And what would be really cool is we're essentially saving a day by gaining the two progress points. But of course, if we fail this, we lose a day. We lose a day. So it's kind of like a risk reward situation. You saw how that loot discard kind of turned out in my favor real nice, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm thinking the second option is the one I want to do. The baddie queue for this one says baddie points, so our total would be five, we're on the fifth day, times two gear locks is 10 baddie points. We add a number of points equal to the party size. We currently have two, so that's two plus the 10, so that's a total of 12 baddie points going into it, which means we'd be pulling two fives uh, for baddies and two ones, which would be four baddies coming at us right out of the gates. And then it says to add a Krellin to the bottom of the battle queue to basically signify that one Krellin that's pulling the raft full speed ahead. And the crazy thing is it would be the fifth baddie in, so it won't come into the mat at the beginning. It will come in later. And at the very and it, and the crazy thing is, is when it does come in, it can't be targeted until the fatigue round. So we basically have to essentially either dance around a little bit and try to avoid taking lots of damage from the first four that come out at us because even if we kill one and the Krellin enters the uh, the next round in, we still can't actually target it and take it down until we hit that sixth round, which is the fatigue round. Very cool. So we also gain a progress point, as I mentioned, an extra one. The success goals in the bottom are a progress point, two training points if we succeed, and a loot, and this is for either choice. Definitely going for that bottom one. I really like the idea of grabbing two progress and having more opportunities to take Nobulus down. Plus it just sounds thematically fun. So let's go ahead and go set ourselves up on the battle mat for this option choice number two. All right, and here we go. We're seeing the raft for the very first time in the playthrough. Really exciting. We'll be doing a full battle on this one. And we've got ourselves a Krellin that's pulling the raft ahead. We've got to set up our baddies in here. We know that our total baddie points is 10 right now. We're on the fifth day. Two gear locks times those together gives you 10. The card that we chose, or at least a choice that we chose in the encounter card, told us to add two extra points to that because of our party size, which is two gear locks. So that's a total of 12 baddie points going into this. Well, that means 12 does not go into 20, so there'll be no 20 point baddie. Even though we went ahead and we scouted ahead in a prior round and found this gorilla, we know it's gonna come eventually, but it's a 20 point baddie, so we will not be seeing it in this particular battle, maybe in the future. But we will be grabbing the very first five, which we also scouted ahead and we know is the primate. And uh, this trap smith here is gonna be the very first one coming into play in lane number one. Now the first thing you're probably noticing is the fact that the actual positions for where the baddies come in is different than the ground or land battles. Instead of it being two columns for the baddies and two for the gear lock, the baddies are on the outside of the raft and the gear locks are in the center. Plus another major change here is that the actual gear locks have melee and ranged in the same spot, meaning we can start in any of these spots in the middle eight because we're essentially the owners of the raft. It makes thematic sense. Baddies are coming at us from all sides. We're not gonna talk too much about these, uh, these spaces just yet. They will come into play when they come into play. I'll talk about them then. Let's get this guy set up in lane number one. He is a melee baddie, so he will be positioned right here. Let's get his initiative guy set up, his health there, and put him in the proper position. 
There we go. So he's got six health underneath him right now. His lane marker is blue, and we know he's melee, so he's going to be moving and starting in this position here. He's not actually moving. He literally starts right there on the raft. His initiative is four, so I put the lane marker for blue at four in the initiative meter, and this initiative meter runs at the very top of the battle mat. Now let's take a look for the next baddie in the queue. So we had 12 baddie points. We took five away to pull this guy out, meaning we have seven left. Seven doesn't go into 20, but it does go back into five again so we're pulling another five point baddie and that is going to be this one we did not know what this one was this is the first time we're seeing it as we did not scout this guy out in advance so it appears we have a goblin that has joined us on the raft. He's jumped off the shoreline and joining the party that's trying to take us down here. And this one, again, is another melee baddie, so it will be in lane number two. We're going to get the marker and the initiative die all set up. Initiative five, so it'll actually be the highest initiative baddie currently on the, uh, the raft. So let's go ahead and put four health chips underneath and get them all set up. There we go. So he's got his four health chips underneath. He's got his lane two marker set and he's in a melee position. You'd think that'd put him over here, but it actually puts him down here. That's what's really interesting about this battle mat is it's very much back and forth. So we got enemies coming on either sides of the raft at us, making for a very interesting battle and uh, harder to hide in the corners here, I find, on the raft. So this initiative die for lane number two is set to five. As you can see right there, it's a five on the chip. And we're going to move into now grabbing a one point baddie which we did scout out and reveal in a previous uh, scout and we found ourselves a chimp so we do have a chimp that's going to be joining us on the raft so let's take a closer look at the stats for this one all kinds of abilities on this particular chimp, as well as being another melee baddie uh, that's going to be throwing attack dice at us. It has a four initiative, so quite high. Two health, not as much health there, so we should be able to deal with this pretty quickly. Let's get the health initiative die and lane marker on this one. This guy will be coming into lane number three, which is the yellow lane. And there he is, all ready to go. Two health underneath. His initiative uh, die is now in the initiative meter at four. He is in lane three, so he will go after another baddie that's in lane number one. So that's all set correctly. We're not going to place this individual right up here. So he's going to be on this off. So everyone's really spread out right now. We have one more one point baddie to bring in here to make up the 12 points. And we're going to grab another scouted baddie. The last one here for the one points that we already knew about. And this one is a another monkey that's going to be joining us so we have goblins we have primates we have chimps we have monkeys we have all kinds of stuff going on here uh, so let's zoom in on the stats for this one and get this fourth lane baddie set up it's times like this that you wish you just had a whole bunch of bananas you could just give to all these monkeys that are flooding the raft so they could just get out of our hair it would be amazing. But it's not like that. We're going to have to actually fight them all off. So this one here is a little tiny monkey who rolls defensive dice, attack dice, has initiative of four. Um, it's untargetable if it lands a bone. So that's interesting. So it's actually really hard to attack it if it happens to land those bones. Has three health. And this is the first range baddie for this battle. So let's go ahead and get this one all set up in lane number four. And there we go. We've got that monkey all set up. Three health underneath. It's going to go into lane number four. It's a ranged baddie, and the initiative die is set to four, as it states right there in the green on the chip. So it's going to be going right in here in terms of the lane and in terms of it being ranged. So it definitely is an interesting layout here. So we have a lot of space on this side of the raft. A little bit of a fun time happening up there. So we've now got all the baddie points dealt with, but the back half of this encounter card mentioned we have to add a crest to the bottom of the battle queue. So we're gonna go ahead and do that now. Now there is something to really note here guys and that's the normal way Krellen come in and the normal way mechs come in which are the two different types or unique types with an undertow. If a Krellen is normally basically brought into an encounter typically if Krellens are added if it doesn't state otherwise they actually go on the top of the battle queue stack. So in other words the Krellen would have normally been the first one out of the gates but because the encounter card specifically states you add a Krellen to the bottom of the battle queue it's doing this thematically based on the encounter because it wants to be the last thing that is taken out plus we're not allowed to target it until the sixth round and it's the one that's basically pulling the raft uh, ahead as we let it essentially to try to gain extra progress but just want to let you know that in terms of how they normally come into play they normally go to the top of the bat of that stack you create and the mechs are the opposite they actually normally go to the bottom of the stack but encounter cards can change that order. 
So now at this point, we're going to go ahead and take that one Krellen that was supposed to be added to the battle queue, and we're going to be placing it just above the raft, because we know when one of these potential baddies are taken down, that Krellen will then come into play at that point. And when the Krellen comes into play, it comes in very differently than other baddies. We'll explain that when it happens. But at this point in time, all the initiatives set up for the baddies. The baddies are in the correct place. All the health is set up. We haven't gone over all the abilities on each of these baddies. We'll talk about that in a second once we get our initiative dies rolled for each of our gear locks so let's do that right now all right here we go with our initiative roll hopefully it's really good because i'd like to be as high up the track as possible here going into this fight we got ourselves two fours okay so that's actually going to put us up quite nicely because uh, most of the baddies are fours three of them are so we'll actually be going second and third in this initiative meter so now that we know the initiative in terms of our gear locks, we're going to go ahead and slot them in. So we know that gear locks go ahead of baddies when they're the same value. So I'm going to definitely put them ahead of those fours. And I can choose whatever order I want. I'm going to have Duster go first, actually. And then Gasket's going to go after that. So then we have really just one baddie basically going ahead of us. That's going to be the setup for the full battle mat. We've got that one crawl in the background that we cannot touch, even if it comes out into play, until the fatigue round, which is the sixth round of the game so let's get into our battle by getting our gear locks onto the raft so just before we go ahead and place any of our gear locks on the mat, it's always good to take a look at some of the abilities that these actual baddies have, because some of them can trigger before the battle, some of them trigger when they're actually placed on the battle mat, and that can actually hinge on whether or not and where we really want to put our gear locks in relation to all the baddies here. So the first one I want to talk about here is the bottom right. This goblin has something called equipment, and then underneath it's mischief too. So we haven't seen equipment before as an ability, so I'm going to read that to you. Equipment says when this unit it enters the battle mat which it has we're going to go ahead and roll a d6 and a number of things are going to happen here based on the roll if it's a one to two we're going to increase the hp stat by two which means this guy will go from a four to a six which would be terrible for us if we get a three to a four we get sharpening stone on him which says increase the attack stat by one meaning he'll be rolling three attack dice at us which is also bad we normally go ahead and take an attack die and put it on the chip to represent that buff. And if he rolls a five to six, he has a he lands the eyeglass at a five to six and basically gets to increase his initiative die by two, jumping him from a four all the way up to the front of the track for a six. Really bad. So let's go ahead here, grab a D6, which I have just off camera here. I'm gonna roll right on the battle mat and we're gonna see what he gets as his buff course he's going to get that initiative jump that's really unfortunate so that is going to be the eyeglass buff and it's going to increase his initiative die by two so we don't have to put anything on his chip but basically he is normally or he is in the purple slot so he's actually oh my mistake he was actually a five but so he's going to go up by two which is really just going to push him to a six but it doesn't change anything so of all the things to roll that was actually exactly the one we wanted to see. So he is now at the very front of the initiative meter, but doesn't get any extra buffs. Mischief, if we want to know what that is, is essentially removing a number of dice, and it's the player's choice, from target's active slots before attacking. So basically, if you have defense dice or anything that uses active slots, he can pretty much go in there and take two of those dice and chuck them. And we get to choose as the gear lock kind of masters or, or controllers as to which active dice get tossed. That's really bad because people like Gasket that use defensive dice could be just chipped away uh, by this uh, you know, mischief, essentially. So that's all about the goblin. Let's head up to the top row and talk about some of the new abilities there. So we'll first talk about the primate on the far left hand side here, the one that says trap. So trap says in land encounters only, the first gear lock to enter the battle mat must roll a d6 and there's all kinds of things that can possibly happen, but it's only when it's a land encounter. So it was a fantastic time to get this primate because the trap ability does not actually trigger at all because we're doing a raft encounter. So that's a thumbs up, that's a big good thing for us. Next up we have blind strike and a value of one so this says before moving this unit deals a number of damage to the strongest adjacent unit so basically if we're adjacent to him before he moves he's going to smack us that's pretty much it 
We've already talked about the monkey who, if he rolls a bone, is going to become untargetable, which is just a die that goes on the chip, which will represent the fact we can't attack it. That will be annoying at times, but is one of the less threatening of these guys on the mat, so we'll just hit it when we have a chance. The other individual here is the chimp acrobat, who has blind strike one. So again, similar situation to the primate we just talked about. If you're next to him, he's going to thump you. And then underneath of that, he has what's called dodge. And dodge is this unit's HP cannot be reduced with attack dice. So in other words, we have to use skill dice. We just can't use attack dice to actually knock this down. We could use loot as well if we happen to have cards that can give damage. We just can't use our attack dice to kill this guy. He's just too good at dodging us. That pretty much sums up all the abilities across the board. Now that we have an understanding of who to be beside and who not to be beside, we definitely realize the value in not putting gear locks next to these two individuals as we will get a strike at us right from the get-go if they happen to uh, activate and we're still there based on the initiative. So let's go ahead and get our gear locks into play now that we know what these guys and how these guys operate. All right, so we've got our gear locks on the battle mat. We have Duster in the bottom left-hand corner, Gasket right in the middle, ready to take a lot of heat. We know that both of the baddies here on these side have this uh, blind strike one ability, which basically allows them to hit somebody adjacent to them, orthogonally adjacent. Remember, you can't hit diagonal um, in this particular case. So we're lucky there. We're going to put uh, Gasket right in the middle, where he likely won't take those hits, for at least for a bit anyway. Uh, and it'll give him enough time to get his shields up so that he can start taking hits without taking damage hopefully and he also has the most buff hp so if he does take hits he can stand the longest again we're trying to delay things here because we don't want to kill off one of these baddies too quickly because the krellen will enter and if the krellen enters in the downside is we can't target it or hit it until the sixth fatigue round which means it can just sit around hitting us hitting the raft breaking up the raft and if we have too much breakage or wreckage on the raft we can lose the encounter if it hits us hard enough that it kills one of our gear locks and then kills the next one we could lose the encounter so we don't want the crawling coming in too early because it's an unbeatable foe until the sixth round so what we really want to do is we want to like use poison to our advantage, use effects that are going to take a couple rounds to kill one of these baddies. So yes, we're managing them, we're hitting them for something, but we're not just blowing them out of the water. Now, of course, the dice could kind of mess with us if we roll really well. We might wipe them right out really early, but I'm going to try to avoid that. So first off, we're starting just like this, and the first baddie that's going to go is going to be this one in the bottom right-hand corner, based on the initiative way up there. So he is going to go first, and he obviously jumped to the front of the line because of that nasty equipment ability on him so we'll go ahead and just initiate him to start us off and now what we're going to do is move him so first off he's going to find a target he has the availability to get to either of these two targets he's a melee baddie so he's going to take a look at distance first so first off he's going to go ahead and take a look he's got three to get to either of them no matter which way he goes so in this particular case, he is going to move two to try to get closer. And he's going to try to get closer to the one that's the weakest of the two. So basically, he's going to head towards uh, Gasket, essentially, in this particular situation. Uh, because there is an equal distance between them. So because of this, we get some options here as to where we want to necessarily place uh, this baddie. But basically, the only logical one, you can go here, here, or we can go here, here. But pretty much, he just ends up landing here. And that's the end of that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so now what's going to happen is there's no mischief happening whatsoever on that ability for the baddie. And we've already dealt with the equipment, so none of that happens. Mischief would normally have two active dice on our gear locks get taken away from us. But we don't have any yet anyway. All right, and next up is Duster. So we're going to move her up the initiative track. She is going to activate next. And she's down here in the bottom left-hand corner. Let's head over to the mat here for her and also take a look at her loot cards. I think some of these are going to come in handy. So right off the bat here, we know that Duster has three dexterity. I also have two buff HP. Uh, she's not injured enough to have Nightshade come out just yet, but very soon, hopefully, that will happen. Uh, we are going to go ahead and use Fortunate Discovery. And this Fortunate Discovery allows me to select one of my consumable skill dice and place it in a spot on your map. I'm going to grab the Blade Dip. I remember this from before we used this one. It was fantastic. I want to use it again. It'll help us with poisoning somebody. So we're going to go ahead and slot that in right there in the consumable section. 
So now I'm gonna go ahead and have Duster spend one of her three dexterity in order to move right behind Gasket here and right up next to the Goblin. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab two attack dice out of uh, the two extra decks that I still have left to spend. We're gonna roll them and try to hit this thing. Now my goal is not to kill it. My goal is to get it very close to death but I certainly don't want to kill it. Now, the other reason I don't want to roll any defense dice is because this thing has mischief too. So if I happen to get any defense dice, they're just going to get stolen away from me anyway, come around the next time. So I'd rather just roll attacks and see what I get. Hopefully I don't wipe it off the mat, but if I do, then I guess we're going to have a Krellin coming a little early. All right, let's see what happens here. A two and a bone, that's actually perfect. So I do some damage as well as getting up my, oh, that's actually perfect. I might be able to use my gadget armor. So we have the two damage to resolve as well as the bone. So first off, I'll take two damage off of this individual. So he's got a little bit less health, but not gone yet, which is perfect. I don't want to remove it just yet. I don't want that Krellin to come in. So this die has been resolved. Next up, we've got the bone. So I'll slot this into our backup plan and we'll talk whether or not we want to use the gadget armor or maybe pack mentality for this backup plan. So with the one bone sitting in my backup plan, I do have the gadget armor here, and this card states that I can deal one damage to any unit. So literally pick any unit on this battle mat here and I can hit them. Now what's really cool about this is remember we talked about this guy right here, the chimp, who has dodge. And dodge says this unit's HP cannot be reduced with attack dice. This would be the perfect opportunity to use that gadget armor to take a hit off of that chimp, especially because not only does it have no defense and it will never roll any defensive dice based on its chip, but we can't hit it with attack dice, so we might as well hit it with backup plan type stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and spend my backup plan bone that I just acquired in order to do a dealing of one damage to any unit. So we'll knock this guy down by one, but again, it doesn't kill him, but it gets him into a range where when I'm ready to let that one go, I'll be able to easily kill it. So that is going to do it for Duster's turn. Worked out really well. And now we're gonna move on to Gasket's turn. So with where Gasket is currently positioned on the battle mat right now, I think it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and we have to roll its Hydro Valve every single time he rolls dice anyway. So we know we gotta take this die out and roll it. Uh, that's gonna take up one of the decks that he has. But also, uh, one thing to note when we start a battle with Gasket is his innate ability allows him to basically start with some active dice equal to half of his defense. So let's go ahead and make sure that we've got that slotted in before we get going, because that can actually make an impact on what we choose in terms of using up his deck. So again, when we roll here, starting with his turn, we have the Hydro die. So we have this die, it takes up a dex that leaves us with three more decks to roll. I already have two defense in here. I could roll to just get a ton of defense. That actually wouldn't be a bad idea because I might end up rolling something like this with a bone. And then at least I'd be able to fill up my thing and also start getting his bones built up. Not a bad idea right now. The other thing that Gasket starts with with from the get-go is his canisters that are supposed to be up in this locked position. So we also don't want to forget about that. Those will tick down based on the consumption of dice like cut, for instance, that we might use. So now he's all set up. I think I'm going to go ahead and roll the Hydro die. We also have five buff HP here in case he needs it. And at some point we have two discardable cards here for loot that allow me to bump up his uh, power converter card or die, I should say, in order to heal him later on, with, which we may need based on him taking a pounding here. He's got basically three enemies coming after him. So I think we should go ahead and just get him uh, you know, more defense to see if we can draw maybe one or two rounds of just taking hits and sustaining. Uh, um, in order to try to delay that Krellin coming out. Uh, we'll see how we can do with that. So let me go to the dice tray here. We'll roll these dice and see what happens. All right, here we go. So again, I have two active slots open and available to be used, but uh, I'm rolling three defensive dice. So really I'm expecting to get a bone here because it's likely possible. We'll see how it goes. And look at that, it worked out exactly how I thought it would. So I'm gonna be able to put those two in the active slot, one bone in the backup plan, and of course I'll have to lose a Hydro. 
So Gask is going to go ahead here and throw in a defensive die there in the active slot. Another one here in the active slot. So now he's got four, which is great. A bone here for Hotfix. And Hotfix says Gasket adds or increases a, def a defense die by one. So technically, I could actually spend this bone right now to bump one of these up to two. That's actually not a bad idea. I'm going to do it off the start. So we're just going to go like this, and we're ready for even more hits because we actually have quite a few attack rolls coming against us in the near future. And of course, I have to take my hydro down by one so we'll go ahead and take this canister and we're going to drop it down to a four if i can find that side here there we go and we'll continue on with the next baddie so the next baddie to activate is going to be the blue baddie, and that's this one right here. So this guy, first off, trap does nothing, a blind strike does nothing because there's nothing orthogonally adjacent to him to hit, which is great. We set that up on purpose. Now he's going to go ahead and find his target. Uh, we've got two targets, one of which is one space away, one's two spaces away. So his target is going to be based on proximity to him uh, or location away. He can move up to two, so he's only going to move one in order to get to a target here, which is going to be gasket and he rolls three attack dice and one defensive die which is nasty and they're all coming at gasket but thankfully gasket has lots of shields and buff hp so hopefully i can survive this attack this is the biggest one on the board currently let's go to the dice tray and see how it goes down not gonna lie, I'm slightly concerned about this because this is a lot of attack dice and something really bad could happen. But I've got five defense, so I should be able to. Here's hoping for lots of bones. That wouldn't be bad. Okay, that's good too, actually. So it got two defense, which is bad. So we're gonna put that on top of the chip for this particular baddie. Two attack comes through at me. I'm gonna use one of my two defense to block it. So this is all negated and taken away. And a bone is a bone is a bone for this particular baddie. So it means absolutely nothing. Now, if that bone had been on the monkey, it would have been untargetable, but that actually wasn't a bad roll. And we still have three defense on gasket. So not bad. All right, so we got that one out of the way. We're moving on to the next baddie. So this is gonna be the chimp, which is right here. So first off, blind strike doesn't apply. No one's orthogonally adjacent to him to attack. And then he's got dodge, which just means essentially we can't hit it with attack dice. It's now gonna go ahead and find a target and attack it closest to it. It is a melee character. It is going to move one spot to be adjacent to Gasket. Gasket is now completely surrounded by enemies and hitting all sides. And is now going to attack with one attack dice and this should be blockable no matter what because the best attack you can get is a two and we definitely have that defense on gasket so here we go the one attack die coming against gasket is a one okay and we're going to go ahead and use one active slot block to take care of that negates it no issues there we still have two defense in his active slot and we move on to the last baddie of the round the green lane baddie Way at the very, very top here. The initiative meter has been fully resolved. We're moving to the very, very last baddie here. This baddie is going to roll defensive die and an attack die. And if it happens to land a bone while doing it, it's going to become untargetable. It's a ranged baddie, though. So this one's really interesting. And this ranged baddie is going to go after the weakest character based on HP. This is not based on buff HP. There's a very big distinction there. I want you guys to be sure you understand that because Gasket has a ton of buff HP. Duster only has two, Gasket has five, but it, it's only focused on when it comes down to targeting whatever's in this little symbol, which shows an individual with his arms down, which means it's going after the weakest because ranged characters or baddies can hit anyone on the playmat. So right away, everyone's a possible target. So it just comes down to who is the uh, true target of his attack. And in this case, Gasket has the least HP. So the target has been identified no movements ever required by the ranged character because it can hit from anywhere ranged baddie so we'll go ahead and roll our attack die and defense die and see what happens all right here we go attack die and defense die let's see if this thing's going to become untargetable it is look at that it got a bone and it got a defense so actually it shields up by one good thing there's no attack through that's good and it bones so that is going to mean that this particular enemy is now untargetable we'll go ahead and put a one of those die uh, on top of the chip of this baddie in order to resemble that and then we're going to move into round number two 
And there you go, we got the defense die on top of this particular individual, as well as the untargetable die as well is going to go on top, so we cannot target it until the start of its next turn. So it's going to get one turn in hiding, which is no good, but it's not that bad because it didn't end up doing any damage to Gasket. Gasket still has two active, uh, or one die, which represents two uh, block for defense. So that's actually really fantastic because we actually held off all of them, without taking any damage whatsoever. And we finished off a round, so we'll go ahead and move all these to the very, very end, and we're gonna tick this round marker up to number two.